Well, that's great because now CAT can help us understand how the um, different methods that people are using for surveillance just iron out all of these data problems so that we can have full confidence in what they tell us, right? Uh, it's nice to be with you, Lisa, especially to come uh, after Anna, uh, Kevin and Bob and yourself. Um, well, where do we start? The first thing is to say that this is not new. We've been trying to track pandemics since around 2003 using uh, these lovely shiny devices called smartphones, but at that time they were sort of one and a half G, not even two G. Uh, I came out of a company, Nortua Networks, that spun off a 200 person size company called uh, Andrew Corporation and later Comscope that actually deployed the first mobile alert system in Hong Kong within 48 hours. Just took them two days with Sunday Telecom. And that app was uh, one where you SMS the number uh, to receive a mobile alert as you came towards a SARS infected building. And having lived in Asia all my life, uh, Australasia, uh, you know, we're not new, it's not new. Pandemics are not new to us. Um, we can go back to SARS, we can go back to Avian, we can go back to the swine flu, of course, which many people underestimate. I mean, about 6 million people came down with the swine flu and there was a vaccine response. Uh, there was MERS more recently, and now we have COVID-19. And so I'm just gonna show you some sort of uh, historical documentation, which demonstrates how much the Australasians have been thinking about this. So back in 2006, we published this for the Australia Research Network uh, that was about securing Australia. And it was an avian flu tracker. I had just come out of industry four years previously, and we were looking at our location service proof. And we were working with a telecommunications company to use their location servers that polled devices in the field to see whether someone was in a quarantine zone, potentially to see if someone was uh, coming into a contact uh, with someone who was COVID positive. And it was all about simulation at that time. Remember, it was a proof of concept, but apps were around. We were looking at 3G. I had just been involved in 3G auction spectrum bids uh, all over the world. And so I knew that this thing was coming where we'd have more location intelligence. And just to trigger everyone's memory, it's not like nobody died as a result of Avian. We even have not eradicated in some parts of the world Avian. And so we you know, went to business and had some scenarios and um, created this particular application, which looked at individual confirmed cases of Avian and then how we could mathematically simulate this in an environment, which was location-based using geographic information systems. You could have a dashboard, you could see alerts. And the whole idea was, well, if we could have health surveillance and visibility, possibly we could reduce the transmission rate of a pandemic outbreak, whatever that pandemic was. Of course, uh, we held uh, annual workshops on this. We had a wonderful uh, doctor from the Cochrane collaboration come to us, uh, Professor Chris Delmar from Bond University at the time, looking at tools of evidence-based evidence practice in making decisions on national security. And here, when we look at pandemics within the realm of national security, we're really talking about social securitization. You know, we have to securitize our populace from disease, from pandemics. And one thing that we took away from uh, Chris's talk uh, was that we would have to have an emphasis of three things. Vaccination of the population, if a vaccination existed, the stockpiling of antiviral drugs, which is what uh, Bob referred to, and physical barriers of hygiene methods. And, you know, wow, he told us the transmission could be reduced by 30% in a pandemic if we just washed our hands properly, 30%. And I still go back to this fundamental process of washing hands prior to a vaccine becoming available. And that's what we're seeing and being encouraged. I have talked to many parents who say, isn't it amazing that this year our kids haven't gotten as sick as previous years because everyone's conscious about washing their hands more often. And if anything was to come out of this pandemic, just that would be enough to ensure that we generally reduce the transmission of other disease that was transmittable either through saliva or, or bacteria or some other thing. So that's a bit of an opener. Um, you know, Chris's main message of just wash your hands more often uh, was heated, but why now? You know, these tracking systems, this AI, this potential to uh, visibly see a pandemic hit before it actually is known to the community at large. 
Um, how can we simulate? How can we watch? How can we be vigilant? And so I had one security guy back in 2004 say to me, you know, Katina, I think it's really simple. One day we're all going to have devices strapped to our bodies. And he said, if I want to check, you know, where there's an outbreak, I'll be going. And I said, really, that's simple? And he said, yeah, and it'll be near real time. I'll have the data. We'll be able to respond really quick and the world will be fantastic. And I said to him, of course, he was defense personnel. I said to him, but do you think the public would accept this? And he said, well, they won't have a choice in the future as all of these dynamic things are unleashed, whatever they might be in society, whether it's trying to bring down crime rates, whether it's a pandemic outbreak, whether it's school education, whether your child is attending school on time and all of these other things. He said, we're just going to have this global dashboard. And I've seen this global dashboard in the Australian defence uh, orientation, uh, particularly with critical infrastructure around about the time of post 9-11. Uh, and many risk-oriented applications were built at that time, particularly to uh, mitigate against uh, short-term things like perhaps uh, a crazy person going and killing 50 people down the road at once within a two-hour period versus knowing uh, what to do in a natural disaster. One of the uh, Geoscience Australia GIS maps that I saw around about 2006, around about this presentation time, uh, was looking at how can we secure our businesses, our businesses users, their other businesses, and this notion of a B2B, a, a business to consumer, a critical clients, a cl clients that re rely on critical infrastructure. We looked at particularly um, water, which powers electricity, electricity, which powers uh, telecommunications and telecommunications that powers banking, all of this interdependency in critical infrastructure and humans are the most vulnerable uh, a node in this entire system. So how can we securitize people? And so we're going through this uh, digital transformation process. That's what I'm going to call it. Governments across the world, they had mobile government strategies and now they're going towards digital transformation. It's the ripe time, I think, in many uh, countries to be experimenting with the potential to reach your citizenry through this humble smartphone, which now such a large portion of the world actually has ownership of. How can we create bi-directional feedback loops with the end user? Here I'm showing a GitHub uh, environment. GitHub is where you uh, put software that's been compiled with use case analysis and other kinds of uh, scenarios and maps and the actual open source code. And in GitHub here, it's an example of an application of knowing the supply chain and understanding where masks are available in pharmacies in Taiwan. Now, Taiwan has one of the lowest transmission rates of um, COVID. And what they've done is built an app looking at the availability of masks in particular pharmacies in an area near you. And what that tells us is that the government has an excellent visibility on perhaps where people are buying masks, where there's a shortage of masks, and areas of concern where there isn't an uptake of masks because there's a huge availability or oversupply. It's a very interesting kind of thing. Wondering as well whether people who go to buy these masks a pharmacy actually use particularly, particular kinds of cards to access the purchase of the masks. So a very sort of indirect but very direct knowledge base uh, of mask availability and transmission potentially. So this notion of mobile government, just-in-time practice, um, contact, location and condition. Uh, together with Dr. Roba Abbas, I've spent maybe the last 16 years looking at the availability of apps that do look at contacts, do look at location tracking, and do look at condition monitoring. And if we start with the fundamental contact tracing concept, we've got this manual process that has been in existence through the World Health Organization. And we've said, now we're going through digital transformation. Now everyone has smartphones. Let's automate that contact uh, contact tracing process. And contact tracing is about relative positioning. It's not absolute. It's not my X and Y coordinate on the Earth's surface. That's location tracking. That's knowing someone's exact location versus someone's relative location to someone else. So we had this big debate over whether we should have um, centralized or decentralized architectures in the software, whether we should go with just a con uh, contact tracing app or a contact and a location tracking app. And then we've had some more uh, 
recent innovations with condition monitoring. And the form factors involved with all of these things, they vary. We have seen apps deployed that do rely on Bluetooth low energy, uh, using the Bluetooth sensors in smartphones. But not all smartphones have the same level of BLE sensor in them. And so sometimes the apps that have been created work properly and other times they don't. Australia had a case where they didn't. Australia just adopted the Singaporean uh, uh, Trace Together app and sort of amended it and landed in trouble when the app that they tried to amend really didn't work with the Apple and Google devices that were proliferating in the Australian community. Other issues uh, that we saw that halted the progress of Australia's contact tracing app, which was also seen in other, other nations, included accessibility issues, um, included only having the app available in English, included the fact that kids don't always run around in the playground with smartphones in their back pockets, despite that they were being encouraged to do so and parents were being told by the government in Australia, get your kids to download the app people with cognitive issues, uh, issues to do with bugs. There were so many bugs. People were receiving alerts through COVID safe uh, and being told that they were coming into contact or had come into contact with someone with COVID, um, a confirmed case of COVID when in fact that was false. So people lost trust in the actual app. And I'll show an example here where um, I started to model. And again, going back to Anna's wonderful presentation, you have to know, if you're going to say, we're going to rely on social securitization and we're going to go to this with a technological response, you have to know the number of people in your country, the number of children in your country or your that space, maybe it's your state or your city. You have to know uh, how many people actually do have smartphones. What's the penetration rate? Um, does every single person have a smartphone or is it a smartphone per household? And what about that discrepancy when people share mobile devices? Uh, the eligible target audience, therefore, is estimated. And then you look at market share. The iPhones, unfortunately, had a greater issue with many contact tracing apps uh, across the world. They weren't registering through their BLE sensor that someone had come into proximity with them, and they weren't exchanging anonymous identifiers between phones. And then you had the Android issues, and we have a whole list of these. Uh, Australian security researcher uh, Vanessa Teague went on to GitHub publicly with friends like Chris Colcane, Eleanor McMurdy, and Robert Merkel, and basically said, here are the issues. We've got payload encryption issues. We've got spoofing issues. We've got consent issues. We've got other issues. And the technical community responded saying, why didn't you give us these apps in open source? So we could at least help you um, overcome some of the preliminary teething problems, which would have meant that the Australian public would have had greater trust in the app and greater trust in the outcomes of the app. And so we could go through this whole list, but I won't bore you. Um, the other thing is that the individual uh, nation states that were investing heavily in their own government-oriented apps were trying to keep beefing up these numbers. Oh, we have a million downloads in the first 24 hours. Oh, we have two million over a week. But what happened was we weren't seeing these public numbers uh, being advertised widely in newspapers. So I took it upon myself and started monitoring how many downloads of the app were occurring daily because the government surely wasn't uh, exposing this. The other thing they did is they got security people like myself and Vanessa Teague and basically tried to uh, silence us in the first days of the actual app when we realized there were issues with the Apple implementation and the uh, Google implementation in terms of the Australian COVID safe app. So the app only cost $2 million, but purportedly uh, the number in terms of marketing reached something like $65 million because they wanted people to download. And they kept going on about, well, it's not going to be mandatory initially, right? It'll be voluntary initially. What did that mean? And Australia, Australian citizens really responded in a way that was unpleasing to the government when that kind of uh, rebuttal occurred. The other thing that happened was, well, we don't really know where these 6 million downloads purportedly came from, like prove it. And then multiple upgrades of these apps. And, you know, if I downloaded it in the first week, do I need to download it again next week and in three months time and today? And this agreement that finally came in terms of exposure when the government conceded that the app they had built wasn't actually working effectively and they would be calling on the help of Apple and Google with their, de with their decentralized system. And so 
a bit of transparency goes a long way in these things. The other thing that we started to see was pressure from various governments. Okay, we have a contact tracing app. It doesn't locate you. It doesn't say where you are on the Earth's surface, but it tells us about your proximity to others that could be COVID positive cases. And so then we started to see this sort of fear mongering. We've bought GPS anklet devices for people that don't comply to quarantine. In places like Hong Kong now, you have a wristband that is worn during quarantine uh, when you should be self-isolating. And if you go outside, your neighbor will surely uh, snitch on you. And we've seen this as well through legislation here locally in Australia, where I am, uh, a family of four were coming back from a COVID area in Victoria and were actually dobbed in by their neighbors for actually being outside and not quarantining. They will find around about 10,000 Australian dollars. So apart from the anklet bracelets that remind us of criminality, apart from these bands that we wear during quarantine, we've also been tinkering with Fitbit devices. Stanford University and Fitbit came together to offer a predictive kind of artificial intelligence-based uh, approach. So you uh, self-organize within the study, you know, you'll volunteer your time, you'll wear the Fitbit, and we're trying to see if we can see symptoms before they actually hit for future pandemics. We've even had drones um, surveil us. Uh, and we are talking about swarm intelligence. If a pandemic that was more aggressive than uh, COVID-19 was, COVID was going to hit, what would we do with drones in the, in the air, surveilling downtown locations where people con congregate, looking at people's um, behavior and their condition? So we're going from this innocent, perhaps contact tracing to this location tracking continuous, not discrete, to this, well, we'll just put up some drones and have a look at how you are. And the threats that came from the local New South Wales government here in Australia uh, was during the Easter period in April, whereby we were told if you're found on the road and you're going between an originating and destination point and there's no real essential business, you're not buying drugs uh, to make you better, you're not visiting the doctor, you're not buying essential supplies, we're going to use automatic number plate recognition systems to make sure you're not breaking the law. So with that, I want to end with one slide. Um, and that's the government as innovator, but public private partnership that's occurring um, in what we used to call this uh, valley, of un, uh, valley of death scenario, where we invent, you know, the COVID safe app really was uh, sort of in a valley of death. And if the private enterprise didn't come in to save the app, it would be completely dead um, today. And so in the public interest, we're going from this app's going to make us money mentality to an app that's about care. And that's in the public interest, right? About health and well-being, about economic prosperity for the public. So what we're trying to do is shift away from this privatized model to this public and the government as an innovator, the government as a digital transformer, um, the government as someone who's willing to come into contact with private enterprise to develop something that actually works. And we could look at China examples uh, and a long history of experiments where they've created public private sandboxes. And I, I don't, you know, the word private within China is, is a bit dubious, but they've created sandboxes where they test their pollution oriented apps, their rideshare apps, their policies. And then they say, right, it worked in uh, the city of uh, Nanjing. Will it work now for the rest of China? It's a bit like what the Wright brothers did when they tested models uh, in increments. And finally, can a whole of government approach work? Can public private partnerships work? And then who owns the data is the big thing <laughs> as this is proliferating. Does the government own it? Does Apple and Google own it? And what does that mean? So I'll end it there and thank you for listening.